and joining us for an in-depth look of the Johannesburg 2 declaration, Gustavo De Cavallo, a political and public policy analyst. He's here with me in studio. Gustavo, thank you for joining us uh, on the program. Momentous occasion here, as we've been saying. Over 40 countries had applied to join the BRICS group. Six have been admitted. What is the impact of the six joining? It's definitely going to be a quite an important impact in terms of the dynamics within the BRICS group. Uh, we, we know that in the next year, when Russia takes over the presidency from South Africa, a lot of the discussions led by ministries of finance, but also governors of central bank, will be a, lo a lot centralized on the issue about the use of local currencies when it comes to trade. Mm -hmm. When we look into countries, particularly within the Middle East, Iran, Saudi Arabia and UAE, they bring a very large amount of liquidity. And this is, has been one of the challenges that many have identified if BRICS members would like to do start, would like to start trading more with the local currencies it enables them to become to to enable that using the local currencies and still be able to trade with those currencies with the other members so a very very important moment of course there was no consensus for until last night with, with with member states when it comes to the nature of the expansion but member states eventually found an agreement and we now have six new members within the block uh, well the, the BRICS members also talked about the flexibility or the lack of flexibility in the current global financial system and moving forward you know they're looking at transitioning into local currencies expand on that for us a bit there's a very interesting moment now when we look into, especially after the, of the war in Ukraine, when many countries within the global south feel that the US dollar has been weaponized or, or a currency that it's seen for many as a, 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 a global economic good and it to a certain extent became politicized and part of this global geopolitical divide. What a lot of BRICS members are trying to do is to reduce those risks, is to a certain extent increase the percentage of their trade that is done with local currencies and particularly doing that within a block where you can create a number of mechanisms, you can create a number of structures that can help them, including with systems of payments and so on. I think it's too early to say that we're going to be having a currency like we heard from President Putin earlier today, but I think especially when it comes trade in local currencies and systems of payments will be on the top of the agenda for the next year. The BRICS countries had already overtaken the G7 uh, in terms of their global might. So what happens now with an expanded you know, BRICS block? I think there is a very interesting dynamics with all of these, these countries. We're looking, for instance, Saudi Arabia, Iran and UAE. These countries are already selling a lot of their oil and gas already to India and China. And I think to a certain degree it showcases also the shift in terms of geopolitical dynamics in the Middle East. For a South African point of view, it was quite interesting because South Africa has very narrowly focused on their demands and needs for more African countries to join. So until last night, the talk was about Egypt joining, not Ethiopia. And then I think South Africa was successful in that regard when it comes to bringing Ethiopia on board. And then we end with Brazil. Brazil is a country that was very skeptical about the expansion. It only changed its minds at the last minute and it's very much tied with Argentina. Brazil and Argentina the economies are very tied with one another and there is an understanding uh, uh, that both countries go together wherever they, they are in global politics. Well, let's look at this geopolitically. You know, we've got Argentina from South America. We've got Iran, uh, you know, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Middle East. We've got Egypt and Ethiopia centrally here um, in Africa. Geopolitically, what is the implication? There is the potential positive geopolitical aspects that it elevates the voice here in, in regions where all of these countries are very influential. Mm -hmm. There's the issue about how this, this group now of 11 countries will be able to coordinate certain positions, particularly when it comes to their demands on uh, uh, reform of international financial institutions. But I think we should be also be aware, and I think it's an important moment to be aware, that there's also some difficulties that will arise. We know there's difficult relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we know the role that China has played this year, very important, bringing the two parties together, and we hope that will continue. Ethiopia and Egypt also very complicated relations when it comes to uh, the, the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam uh, that has created a lot of challenges. But also we should not forget that Argentina and Iran itself have very fractured relations since the 90s. And, 19, and 2024 will be the 30th anniversary of the bombing of the uh, Jewish Association in Buenos Aires that effectively frozen the relationship between the two countries. It is an opportunity, but I think the existing members and new members should also be aware of that they, they need to 
creates confidence building between the partners and also identify very clearly what the decision making process will be going forward. President Xi talked about this though, uh, you know, uh, he talked about writing a new chapter for the Global South. Now, you know, the BRICS block has now become a major trading block. As a new chapter uh, for the Global South, what is the implication there? Certainly, we're going to continue seeing a lot of Global South countries looking at BRICS with a lot of interest. I think there is opportunities for BRICS to become even more vocal when it comes to global to global issues and including with approximation and dialogue with groups like the G7. I think at this stage we're starting to see not only BRICS as that junior partner of global governance but indeed actually being much more uh, capable of projecting influence in a lot of global geopolitical disputes. But I think also internally I think BRICS members really need to use that opportunity of ensuring that there is cohesion within the group and there is clarity around what the group is expected to achieve. We can't see the expansion just at expanding too much of the topics and then at a certain extent diluting the influence of BRICS. So I think it's a very fine line that our member states are going to be uh, uh, threading in, in the next couple of years and I think but it's definitely a very important potential for increasing the voice of countries from the global south. Very briefly Gustavo, what next now heading on from BRICS 2023? Next now certainly will be the discussions led by ministers of finance and governors of central banks. Mm -hmm. It's a very technical, very difficult discussion when it comes to local currencies, to system of payments, of reserves. There is a number of issues within this broader agenda of currencies and that for me will dominate a lot of the debates for the next year. Gustavo Cavallo, thank you very much for joining us here today in Johannesburg.